Lego, you're towing a fine line with this video here, man. You're kind of abusing your position as a YouTuber here, man. You gotta be really careful with how you frame this, man. And I know that's sort of the sentiment that can arise from a video topic like this. I try to make it so that we don't make videos about things where it's like, oh, I think this could happen, or I personally, like me, Lego Rocks, Geo the guy, I think this is a thing that could happen or that's gonna happen or whatever. I try never to put myself in the position to be bringing up topics. I always link articles, I talk about radio hits, I talk about what smarter people are saying, people who actually have connections, people that know what they're talking about. I just react to give my opinions on these things. And so when it comes to a video topic like this, this definitely isn't something that's normally up the alley of LEGO Rocks 99. But, because of all the other pieces surrounding this conversation, I feel like this topic is more so the conclusion that's easiest to come up to. So, we're going over to the Vancouver Canucks and one of their top players, JT Miller. We're talking about him once again because when it comes to the saga leading up to the trade deadline, there were so many conversations about Miller getting traded. Oh, the Vancouver Canucks are trying to undo their mistake of signing Miller to a seven-year by $8 million AAV contract. And if they're able to do this, then that would be amazing. They'd trade Miller away, free up cap space, get a boatload of stuff in return, this, that, and the other thing. But when it came to the final decision, Vancouver ultimately decided to keep JT Miller. Patrick Alvin said to the media he had no formal offers for Miller. However, just because Patrick Alvin may not have received a formal offer from any team about Miller, that doesn't mean they didn't talk about him in the slightest. We had insiders like Rick Dollywall, Darren Drager, and a whole bunch of other people on social media pretty much telling the tale of the tape that, hey, the Canucks are conversing with X, Y, and Z about JT Miller, and this team wants Miller, and they want a long-term center, and this and that. In fact, if you go over to the fourth period in their trade deadline watch of 2023, you could see their write-up. This is what it says. Miller's seven-year, $56 million contract extension kicks in July 1st, and it includes a full no-trade clause. The Canucks are taking calls and exploring the market on Miller, and in the two weeks leading up to the deadline, his name has come up more often. And then at the bottom, it says teams that were reportedly linked to JT Miller, you have Seattle, Pittsburgh, and Carolina. Now, we had already made a few videos going over the Pittsburgh Penguins in that situation with Miller and whether or not he could have been a fit there. Reportedly, it was the Penguins offering a whole bunch of draft picks and capital for Miller, but the Canucks said no because the reports were that they wanted a young center. But I wanted to instead talk about the Carolina Hurricanes in this video, mostly because when it comes to all the things that sort of form our narrative on JT Miller, it kind of points us in a direction that isn't really said verbatim, but is somewhat of the more rational conclusion to make when you look at everything involved. Firstly, let's go over to JT Miller and the Hurricanes talk made on Sakaris and Price, done by Darren Dreger. This was from before the trade deadline, the day before actually. They could do it for sure, until Alvin comes out and says we're not trading JT Miller. We're going to talk about it. The teams that are interested are going to continue to pester Alvin. And according to Dreger, it is indeed Carolina that is interested. He also said, when it comes to after the trade deadline, whether or not the Hurricanes were indeed interested in Miller, I believe that's true. That's accurate. I believe another Western Conference team could potentially have been involved too, but Rick Dollywell reporting that the Hurricanes wanted Miller was 100% on point. There were conversations from other NHL insiders and analysts that the Hurricanes in particular, we're looking for a long-term center, a guy who has term on his deal, not a rental type of player, but somebody that can stick around for a while. And Miller being signed on till the end of like 2030 or whatever it is, makes a lot of sense when you talk about quote-unquote long-term fits. Now, when it comes to returns, it was already mentioned in the media that the Canucks had an offer or two from the Pittsburgh Penguins that included a bunch of draft picks, but the Canucks themselves wanted a young center in return. They did not want just draft capital. And Patrick Alvin had that weird quote in the media where he said, yeah, I'm not going to get draft picks just to get draft picks. I'm going to get draft picks to draft good players or trade them away for other good players. And that's kind of a contradiction because what in the hell else are you able to do with draft picks? But either way, the Canucks reportedly wanted a young center from Pittsburgh, and I kind of brought up the idea that said, hey, you're not going to get a young center from Pittsburgh, unless it's like Ryan Paling, who isn't really all too valuable anyway. There's Jeff Carter, Sidney Crosby, Malkin, you're not going to get this done. Why even talk to the Penguins about this? 
But this is where the other conversation comes in, because when it comes to the Carolina Hurricanes, they do indeed have themselves a guy that sort of fits the bill as to what the Canucks are looking for on paper. In order to help us identify that, we'll go over on a Shana's Twitter account because she did a very good job at this trade deadline, by the way. She broke a whole bunch of news, a whole bunch of trades, and she just did really good work. This tweet was made after the Philip Hronick deal and before the NHL trade deadline. Does acquiring former first-round picks ease the pain of moving their own out? That seems to be the line of thinking right now in Vancouver. There's another young forward, high first-rounder on their radar. The deal hasn't materialized yet, so we'll see if it goes anywhere. Now, that is sort of cryptic in the way that she wrote that, but essentially she's asking the question, do you feel more comfortable moving out first-round draft picks when you're able to get former first-round picks in other trades? The first-round pick that the Canucks moved out recently in the Hronik deal was in the Bo Horvat trade, that Islanders pick. By the way, we're going to talk a little bit more about that tomorrow, but... Does this moving out of the pick feel a little bit better if the Vancouver Canucks are able to get themselves another young forward, a former high first round player who is already on their radar? And if we combine this with the Carolina Hurricanes talk, the very easy conversation that you could bring up is whether or not Jesperi Kotkaniemi was the guy the Canucks had on their radar. Again, this is like not normal Lego Rocks 99 video territory. I don't like to connect the dots myself. I like to let other smarter people do it for me. But... This one is so plainly obvious that the Kotkaniemi for Miller idea had been tossed around there by a few other random people I'd seen on Twitter. Not any analysts in particular, but just a lot of fans connecting the dots as well. Okay, well, the Canucks want a young center. The Hurricanes want a longer-term center with term. If the Hurricanes are linked to Miller, then that means that the young forward the Canucks might want probably is from Carolina, and Jesperi Kotkaniemi is right there. $4.8 million till the end of 2030, he's 22 years old, and this season he's got 30 points in 63 games played. Not the best point production, especially out of a guy who's making that amount of money, but as we had talked about in the prior video where Kotkaniemi had a 5-point game of all things, he has looked a little bit better this past little while. He's starting to expand on that playmaking, and he's starting to look more effective. Plus the fact that he was super clutch the other day when he won the shootout for Carolina against the Montreal Canadiens in the Bell Center. He's had himself a pretty good past few weeks here. And, of course, you're not going to try to go out there and say that his entire rest of his career is going to be defined by this past few weeks he has had, but it is a good sign. He's still young, he still has a lot of room to develop, and I personally would like to see Kotkaniemi become a good NHL player. I don't know about you. Whether or not that's possible, that's an entirely other debate. But it can't be said that this isn't the more obvious choice looking out there when it comes to the Canucks and Miller. If this is the case, if the Canucks were indeed looking at a guy like Jesperi Kotkaniemi, who is a former high pick, and who is in a position where a lot of NHL fans are kind of questioning whether or not that contract is really worth it, he sort of fits the bill as to these other players that the Canucks have acquired recently. You've got the Atu Ratus, the Vitaly Kraftsovs in there, Jesperi Kotkaniemi in there too. Guys that had a little bit more pedigree when they were younger, but who sort of fell off as their years went on. Rutherford and Alvina have been very adamant when it comes to acquiring or targeting guys who are young and can help us in the short term as well as in the long term. Why did I say us? I'm not a part of the team. But you get what I mean, don't you? Jesperi Kotkaniemi, in theory, fits that bill. It's just, in my opinion, if you were to say, okay, Miller for Kotkaniemi and, like, something else, I personally don't think Kotkaniemi is really going to be too amazing when he hits his prime. Like, you talk about what Anthony Bavillier was for the Islanders when he was in that organization. I feel like Kotkaniemi could sort of become that, but maybe just a tad better. Now I know Bavillier is a winger and Kotkaniemi is a center. It's an entirely different conversation there. More responsibility, more leeway, etc., etc. But for KK... After seeing him play in the NHL for all these years, I never really had that awakening moment within me where I was like, yeah, okay, he's good. Like, he is doing the thing. Tage Thompson, Jason Robertson, all these guys that have been sort of late bloomers at the National Hockey League level, they had their aha moment where a lot of us, myself included, looked at them and said, yeah, they're legit. Kotkaniemi has not had that yet. And as I said, he is young enough to the point where he could have it sooner rather than later, but... For right now, what JT Miller is, he is a, let's just say, point-per-game caliber guy who could get 99 plus 100 points in a season if he's lucky, and Kotkaniemi is, let's just say, a middle-to-bottom six caliber forward who's making $4.8 million until the end of 2030, and that is a long freaking contract that's pretty expensive too. 
The Canucks, thinking about Kachanyemi makes sense, but at the end of the day, I'd be lying to you if I told you I'd want to have this conversation again. So let me know your thoughts in the comment section below about this sort of investigative journalism I've been doing here, thinking about different things with the Canucks and Miller and the Hurricanes and trying to piece together what a return could have looked like or what the Canucks would have been targeting in that situation. We talked about KK here. Do you think there's anybody else that could have been a subject of Vancouver's interest? Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. I hope you enjoyed this video. And bye.